good afternoon. Um, for those of you on your phones, uh, um, inside the mic, yes, sorry. Um, those of you on your phones, that QR code does work if you do want to scan and uh, follow the presentation, um, because I see that some of you are. Uh, before I continue, a quick self, shameless self-promotion. Um, my name is Pratiksha, uh, and I am a lawyer. Um, the doors are open, and if you do want to leave, I will not feel offended. Um, but to say that I am an academician, I studied and trained in India. Um, I qualified in the UK, now I work in Belgium. I'm doing my PhD um, in digital law, data law, consumer protection, um, and an aspect of which is competitive law, um, to introduce newer audiences um, to aspects that may not have been seen before. Um, and that's the purpose of my presentation today. Um, Again, this is going to be a very academic legal paper. I promise you there is not one line of code in all of these slides presented. I apologize, but I'm not sorry. Um, um, a quick run through of what I'm going to do today. Uh, with this audience, I will not even attempt to explain malware and botnet, but I will go into what the position is in India and my research question. Um, so, um, the research question that I did want to analyze was, should governments um, be entertained to provide solutions to malware and botnet issues? Um, why governments? We had a very nice conversation with Matam previously, um, and we saw the, the dark side of the government in banning accounts. Um, but with this case study in India, we also see that they're providing some potential solutions. And should they do this? Should they not do this? Um, so the research is in two parts. The first part is very descriptive. It describes the position in India. It describes what they're doing, what is the center doing. Um, and the second part is more normative. The normative aspect answers the question, ought they should do it? Um, from an economic, technological, and a legal perspective, so stick around. Um, a quick, quick summary and a quick historical note of what is the center in India. Um, so the Ministry of Information and Technology in India, um, they had something called a CERT. You all know what CERT is. Um, and that was established in 2004. However, in 2014, um, the government of India also launched something called a Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, uh, which is supposed to be Clean India Campaign to clean the streets for public sanitation. It was also used in multiple other programs. And one of the ways in which this Clean India campaign was used by the Ministry of Information Technology was to involve and have a clean digital environment. Clean as in free of malware, free of botnet. And in 2017, they established the Cyber Swatch Kendra. Um, the Cyber Swatch Kendra is the malware analysis and botnet analysis training center. Um, so this center, in a sense, works this way. Um, they, it, in, a, in a very in a very nuanced, very, very minute essence, um, they try to analyze what are the botnets, how a report incidents and how they can be resolved in a very, very basic way. Um, the alert users, and you could click on that link on that slide, but I will quickly run through the, um, the screenshots from their website. Do remember that they keep updating their website, so by the time you visit it, it might not be similar. Um, this is what the, this is what the, the center does. Um, they provide security tools for users to for use them to remove any botnet or malware on their on their, on their devices, uh, when a user complains, when a user reports an incident uh, that there is malware on their system, such tools can be used. These tools are provided by the government and they're free, um, so you could download them and use them if you need to. Um, the government also encourages financial institutions to use such tools because they say that it comes with government backing. Uh, we shall not discuss to what extent government backing would help, but this is an option that is provided to financial institutions if they are affected by any malware. Um, again, these are relevant tools that they use. So this is provided to the users for free. Um, as a user, you could, if you do have any malware issue, use these tools. Now comes the fun part of this discussion to say, 
should governments be even providing such tools? What is the role of the government in, in involving itself in research, in development, and investing in the provision of such tools? Um, well, good question. Um, okay, we'll come back to that later. Um, to say, okay, this is we do this for for the country, we do this for the benefit of society. Taking a very paternalistic view, they say, no, we have the government, and if, if Patrick is here, sorry, from the Council of Europe, if Patrick was here, he'd say, yes, we're in a war with cybersecurity crimes, and we have to protect it, and this is the view of the government. Well, very good. Um, from an economic perspective, yes, this is beneficial. To say We're working towards larger economic benefit of the country as a whole. We're developing digital economies. Therefore, we want to establish a clean digital environment. Very good. Um, from a technological perspective, government argues that okay, we have know-how, we have, we have the malware, we have malware analysts, and we can say, okay, this is, this is the solution. Amazing. But then, what is the flip side to this? Should governments be doing this? Um, there, is, there is an extensive burden on the economy, coming from a country like India, where there are other problems. Like Matan discussed, we have third world problems, we have developing country problems, we have global south issues. These issues not only include poverty and hunger, these issues also include a budding and a fledgling digital economy where, where the internet is a norm in global north countries, internet is still a luxury in India. Um, the government would have to keep up with these technological know-hows, they're constantly developing, which goes back to this slide which says these are the current threats that they advertise on their, on their website. However, if you see, it says new um, on, on that. And to establish a set list of malware, to say, okay, this is the malware that's there, these are the threats, we'll share these threats with you. But this list is gonna be constantly being updated and it's not gonna be a static list of, of malwares or, or issues or threats that they face. And lastly, uh, which is more from a competition perspective, if certain tools are advertised of sort by the government to say, okay, these, these are the tools that we say are useful, then what happens to private entities? What happens to companies that, that indulge and that invest in, in providing solutions? If the government is gonna provide a free workable solution, private companies would run out of business our jobs would be at stake, and it will create an unusual monopoly in the market to say, okay, the government has a solution, why do we have to look anywhere else? Very good. Um, to say one solution is better than the other, should governments do this or should not governments do this, uh, I'm going to give a very loyal, lawyer-based answer to say it depends. It depends on the, it depends on the situation. Uh, there's no one answer whether governments should or should not do this. Governments across the world, this is only a case study from India, governments across the world have given reports to say, okay, these are cybersecurity issues, these are malware and botnet issues. However, India has gone one step further and established this center that lists out these threats that provides these tools. So why does it work for a country like India? Should it work for a country like India? Um, yes, it works for a country like India because we are a very diverse population. Uh, we have a very lower middle income country, which means that we don't have access to resources that can help find these solutions. So government providing free solutions does work to an extent. And when the government pitches ideas like a digital India by 2030 and calls for foreign investment in India in the digital space, we want to provide a clean space. So it works for a country like India. What does this mean when I present this to a European audience? What does this mean for you? Um, this just means that this is one perspective from India. Will it work for a country like France? Will it work for a country like Germany? Will it work in the EU? The answer is, I don't know. Will it work for another global south country? The answer is, maybe. This is a possible potential solution where the government may step in and they could provide solutions. Should the government do it? Should not the government do it? It depends, again, it depends on national regimes. It depends on sovereign goals. We're not going to say that we're supposed to do this, but as a lawyer, we can say, okay, let's take a step back, and as an academician, debate. Debate and see whether governments should or should not do this. Yes, this works for countries like India. This may not work here. Um, 
but we're just going to open up the floor and say, this is a possible solution. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my quick presentation. It was super short, I realize. But the reason for this super short presentation is for, to open up the floor for questions because um, I want to present my work in front of a non-legal audience and to say, okay, has my work reached here? And as practitioners in this space, does this solution make sense to you? Um, and I hope I have confused you more than I have convinced you at the end of this presentation. Um, again, you can scan the QR code for my presentation and any other questions, you can reach out to me. Um, I will be here all week, but if you do want to avoid me like the plague, it's fine, I am a lawyer, I understand. <laughs> Um, any questions? Thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, I wanted to know if I'm, let's say I'm an Indian citizen and uh, the, the government recommend me some software to use and I get infected by malware they described. Yes. Uh, can I sue the government for misleading me into using this tool? And did you think about these possibilities for the citizen? I, I will give you an example, uh, yeah. which <laughs> it did happen with that. Um, so during the COVID pandemic, we had in India, there was a, a mandate to install certain applications for COVID tracking, for vaccination statuses. There were applications based on that. Um, it, they took it a step further and they did not have malware. But all the health data, which is considered as very, very crucial data, very personal data, was leaked. Um, this was not a malware leak, malware issue, but a data breach issue. And certain citizens sued the government and they said, well, we apologize, we will fix this data breach. We're sorry, um, but they didn't take it further. So it's an example of where the government did make a mistake. It is a data breach. Uh, taking a step back, taking the lawyer's point of view, India does not have a position like the EU of the GDPR. We do not have data protection legislation. Uh, it's still in its bill form, we're still debating it, it's still happening, um, but we don't have GDPR to protect us. So still health data is not considered personal data, but they said, well, it's a data breach, and you said, if we give you our data, it will not be breached. Um, the government said, well, sorry. <laughs> we're sorry, I don't know what else to say. Um, this happened, I believe, in 2012 as well with the Aadhaar case where biometric information was leaked. Um, sorry, we'll do better next time. We don't know what else to tell you. Any other questions? But, but thank you for your question. It just means that my legal knowledge has, has gone to this audience, which I'm very thankful for. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the tools that the government was uh, giving to people. Uh, are these tools uh, developed by the government itself or are they uh, working with some companies? Uh, no, they're not developed by the government. They enter into something called... Either they just buy the tools from private companies or they enter into public-private partnerships to develop these tools um, that which means that the governments enter into contracts with companies to say, okay, these are your threats and these are the tools that we want for these threats. But again, the time that it takes to develop constantly new tools, to deal with constant new threats, um, I don't think the government is able to keep up with. In a realistic manner, it should work. It, theoretically, yes, this seems very conducive for the government that it gets the money and for the, the company that makes the money as well. But practically, I don't think it works. Um, solely because the threats are developing very rapidly and the tools just can't keep up. Thank you. But the government is trying, so... <laughs> Thank you. Yes. yes. You mentioned that uh, the government spends a lot of money in developing yes. these tools. 
in your opinion, it would not make more sense to spend this money on teaching people how to protect itself? Please give your take on that. Um, so one of the one of the agendas of this the, this botnet center is to educate people and spread awareness. That has been the objective of the Ministry of uh, uh, Information and Technology from its from its from its origins to say, okay, we're going to educate people. We're going to spread more awareness. Um, but where is this awareness going to be spread? When is this awareness going to be spread? Is it going to be spread in schools? Is it going to be spread to every person who has a mobile device? Is it going to be spread to every person who buys an electronic device? Who is this consumer who has to get this information? Uh, another, another layer of co additional complexity that's added when it comes to India is which language should it be spread this information in? This website, if you can see on top, it says English and Hindi, which are two languages in India. Uh, we have about 30 recognized languages in India, so what about the other 28 languages? Um, though awareness has been a major issue, that is only one of the ways that consumers are made aware of the potential threats and say, yes, don't click on this, don't click on spamware. I can tell my parents who are 65 to say, don't fall for this, this is incorrect, but there has to be a level of okay, protection that the government wants to provide. So that's why they do this, in, ad in addition to consumer awareness and education. Uh, yeah, but they do spend money on that as well. Other questions? Yeah, Eric. Yeah, um, in the page where you show the list of uh, tools that you can download, yeah. it looks like there is no mention of open source or st stuff like this. I remember that with COVID in France, it was a big thing that the application was open source. Even with that, there was a lot of discussion. Is there some kind of the same discussion in India about this kind of stuff? Um, the reason that these softwares, these antivirus tools or anti-malware tools, they're not open source is solely because they've been bought by, from the private companies and the private companies do want to keep them open source, uh, op closed. But there are other tools that are open source, but they're just not recommended or provided by the government. Again, that's where the problem arises, where these, these certain tools now generate a sort of monopoly to say, okay, that there is, the government recommends this, why will I not use this? Uh, well, it, ha it needs a well-educated or a rational consumer to say, well, let me choose this instead because it has open source software and, and I can see what is happening, rather than such tools. Um, but these tools, as of now, they're not open source. There are other tools, but they're just not recommended by the government. Again, should the government even be doing this? We don't know. Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I think it sounds like you mentioned uh, providing like resources and yes. education. Yes. Uh, another issue I think at least I've seen before um, is also, uh, you know, kind of this idea that sometimes privacy or security can be a luxury, right? So we see like a lot of older devices or lower end like budget devices. Has there been any consideration for like either subsidizing devices or um, like working with companies to just improve security, like security of their devices? Uh, it's like looking at actual devices that end up in users' hands as opposed okay. to edu educating? Um, by this, just to clarify, do you mean that to say, okay, um, but the government takes steps to ensure that devices that go out into the market are more secure? Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, Socratarian method of teaching. Do you believe that would be anti-competitive to say that that's, the certain companies cannot do something with their devices? Would that be a restriction to your research and development as a company to say, would the government, when the government puts a ban on some things that I can and cannot do? Uh, in, in the EU, we, there was a recent discussion to say, all of us are gonna have USB-C chargers and companies just strict, uh, went against that and went bonkers for a couple of years saying, this is, this is our freedom to do research and development and we wanna have ch what charger we want to have and, and charge 25 euros to buy one charger. When the government starts putting restrictions like this, the companies 
always have a contra point of view. And they will not listen, practically. They will not listen to such government restrictions unless there is something in it for them. So governments usually try not to restrict companies uh, and their operations in certain ways, rather provide education. Um, but again, to say that in India, a large majority of internet users, it is expensive exploded after 2016 because there was there were a, there were multiple actions that happened in 2016 that led to the explosion of the internet and use of mobile devices and it's 2060 we're not talking about 1960s so from 2060 until about 2023 all of this the, the focus on internet security internet development infrastructure in terms of handheld devices mobile phones has, is, again, it's in its nascent stages, uh, but the answer to your question in a short way is no. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's, it's very interesting to see IT people want to interact with a lawyer. From my experience, they try to run away from me, but thank you. I'm not scared. <laughs> Bite, I promise. Thank you for the great information. Um, has there been some sort of government disclosure on their visibility into the data that is uploaded or viewed by these malware softwares? Kind of like the big brother concern is how much visibility do they have into what users upload to those malware uh, checkers? Okay, so does the government disclose what the malware actually discloses to, from the takes from the public in a sense. Or, or yes. Or what what data the government has access to f from 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 the malware uh, uh, from what is uploaded by the users. Um, okay. Ha has this the government explained if they have access to the data and so on? Um, because you could upload a, yes. a, a word document that yes. you find suspicious and. Okay, uh, in short, no, because, um, but, however, we lawyers love to say however. Um, however, uh, the government has a program called the Right to Information Scheme, where you can file a claim to ask for information, to say, okay, can I have access to such information? And the government is mandated to disclose it to you, deeming fit. Um, as a default, no. They do not disclose it, but it is a possibility to do so, if, if that makes sense. But do, but do we know if the government has access to the data that was shared to the uh, software providers? Um, I mean, if, if you use such a tool, then yes, because this is government run. Yes, no. <laughs> I, I'm always up for debate, so. Am I, am I understanding your question correctly? Yeah, well, okay. wouldn't that dissuade individuals from using that program if they're just handing over information from their machines directly to the government without having some sort of like understanding of what the government is collecting? Um, okay, so the way, that, the way that the government says that these tools work is that, okay, if you detect malware on your device, use this tool, we will resolve it for you. So that is all the information that is provided to the consumer. Very basic information. So the government does not disclose any of the information that it collects. But it could if you do file an RTI. Is that included in that bill that is you're uh, like discussing is like the data privacy part? Yes, yes, very okay. much so. It is very much in line with the GDPR. So that, that's what the bill is trying to do, to say, OK, People have data, and well, let's try to protect it. We'll discuss this after this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very happy with the answer that I've given you, and I'm sorry for that. Okay, I think we're ready for the next talk. Okay. Oh. Okay, thank you.